Our next speaker is brought to you by the Sound Money Center. He's going to talk to you about the Federal Reserve. I want you to please welcome Mr. Doug Jaden. Well, thank you. I, you know, I was hoping you weren't booing me, but the uh, the good old Fed. We'll talk about those guys in in just a minute. First of all, uh, it's a privilege to be here. It's an honor to be here, and I want to thank the Tenth Amendment Center, Michael Bolden, John Michaels, Mike Meharry, all these guys. They do this relentlessly because they care about our freedom. So, indeed, we want to give those guys a a hand. If you haven't done it, then I would highly recommend that you just go personally thank them when you see them because this is this is tough work. It's uh, in many ways, um, it's a very difficult work, and it is some of the most important work going on in our nation today. Well, we're t- here to talk about sound money, and first thing I want to do is lay a little bit of a groundwork because I never want to assume that I'm totally preaching to the choir. And in case there are some folks out here who are not necessarily in the choir and are still a little bit fuzzy on what this whole issue of sound money is, I want to lay down a little bit of a history of money and our monetary system here in the United States so you can get a little bit of a picture as to how we got into the mess that we're in today. So I'll spend a few minutes just kind of going through this and then I'll just kind of speak from my heart about I think where I think things are going and what we can do about it. Okay. Um, apart from medieval China, which invented paper money, they, they, they invented both paper money uh, certificates and, and paper money in general. As far as the West is concerned, they had never seen paper money before until the colonial government of Massachusetts emitted fiat paper in 1690. So there, here in, in this country began this grand experiment of using paper slash fiat money, and it caused all kinds of problems in the colonies. One thing we saw is, if you understand, how many have heard of Gresham's Law? Gresham's Law, all right, very good. Well, i got a, a lot of choir out here. That says that bad money drives out good money in an economy, but it only happens if there's legal tender laws to force the use of the bad money. If that happens, then guess what? People are going to say, well, you're going to force me to use this junk. I'm going to take the good money, and I'm going to hoard it. And it just disappears from the economy. Well, Massachusetts, they understood that, so they passed these legal tender laws that force people to accept this paper currency. It's a new experiment. So all of a sudden, you see the, the specie, which is gold and silver coin, begin to disappear from the economy. The problem is paper money allows economies to be goosed, uh, using low interest rates, using uh, a lot of uh, creation of the money to put the money supply out there and make it grow. And so you get this illusion of prosperity. Well, unfortunately, that happened, and other states began to pick up on that. Uh, there were several states that did this as well. You have Connecticut, Carolinas, Pennsylvania, and then the state that became the uh, the chief debaser and abuser of this paper money, Rhode Island. So all the colonies, a lot of the colonies began to use this fiat and paper money. Well, as it always does, it did not end well. And Daniel Webster uh, was noted for letting us kind of have an understanding of what the problems were with paper money. Okay, he said even back then, he said, guess what? Of all the contrivances for cheating the laboring classes of mankind, none has more been more effective than that which deludes them with paper money. See, it's an illusion. Wealth built on a paper money system has always been and always will be an illusion. At some point in time in the future, the system dies and all of the wealth, quote unquote, that's been built up dies with it. Well, eventually it happened. Reality caught up and those in control of issuing this paper money lost control of it and they had all kinds of problems in the colonies. So a few months prior to the drafting of the Constitution, George Washington wrote to a Rhode Island senator, and he had this to say about paper money. Paper money has had the effect in your state that it will ever have to ruin commerce, oppress the honest, and open the door to every species of fraud and injustice. Well, guess what? Washington and all of our founders were keenly aware of this history of paper money, and they wanted no part of it. Um, not just because of the state's recent problems with it, but he was keenly aware, and they were all aware of these problems with paper money as they had happened throughout history. John Law, you know, he, he tried to pull France out of the Depression in the early 1700s, and he had the Mississippi Company. There was that big scheme. It blew up, caused all kinds of economic problems in France. And then they had this little thing called the Continental that was used to fund the Revolutionary War. Now, 
in our trip out here, I, I, I stopped out with my daughters. They came out here with me, and we, we went on a tour of Valley Forge. And as I'm listening to this little 18 minutes uh, presentation that they give before you kind of go around the, the, uh, the area there, they, they made a comment there that I thought was very telling. They said, one of the problems, there's a, there's a misconception out there, the Valley Forge was so bad because the winter was so harsh. And in reality, it was supplies. They were undersupplied. The troops there were undersupplied. And one of the reasons they were undersupplied was that the local people in the area who had provisions did not want to accept the Continental. They didn't want to accept the paper money. So they traded with people who had hard currency. That's the term they use out of Valley Forge. Well, what is hard coin? It's gold and silver specie. It's constitutional money. It's, it's the hard money that has always been money throughout all of recorded history. So George Washington understood this as well. The Founding Fathers understood these problems with paper money. And they wanted no part of it. None. Not even a little bit in this nation. They saw the hardship that it caused. They wanted nothing to do with it. So when they get to the Constitutional Convention... Uh, they had a, a real discussion about whether or not to allow the United States to emit bills of credit. And there was a big argument about, well, should we allow them to do that? Should we not? Bills of credit are basically paper money. Okay, that's what we're talking about, emitting bills of credit. Well, guess what? That language was stricken. So if you want any evidence that the founders ever intended for us to have paper money, there's all kinds of evidence out there. I'm just touching on some of the highlights. Paper money is a, is, a, is a problem. It has been a scourge anywhere it's been tried in the history of mankind. And, the, and, and our founding fathers absolutely wanted nothing to do with it. So much so that even Alexander Hamilton, who was in, very much in favor of uh, allowing the United States government to go into debt, he, he said it may be a national blessing. He wanted to ease the, the burden of taxation on the people in times of war. He even, in his Coinage Act of 1792, uh, made the punishment for debasing of the coins by people in the mints, these people who were working in the mints, he made it punishable by death. Okay? So understand this, people. Our founding fathers wanted nothing. How much? Nothing. nothing to do with paper money systems. Now the question we have to ask is why? Why is that? Why no paper money? I mean, we can say, all right, is it because, well, let's see. They, they wanted to uh, avoid the problems of debasing. Yes, that was one of it. But they had some other issues as well. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. That didn't stop the bankers, okay? They, they wrote this, uh, the Constitution, and, and it did not have provisions for emitting bills of credit. The coinage Jack said, you know what, we're going to kill you if you debase it. But that didn't stop the bankers. The bankers wanted to get a control of the monetary system, and they had, they had their issues that they wanted to deal with. They wanted to gain control of the system so that they could control the issuance of money and credit and eventually get us into this paper money system. We had the first and second bank of the United States that were uh, chartered somewhere between 1791 and ended in 1836, and both of them were put down. The people saw after after they were chartered, they each had a 20-year charter. No, we don't necessarily like what's going on here. And Andrew Jackson survived an assassination attempt, which was very interesting. Um, just as an aside, every president that has had an attempted assassination or has been assassinated, check into what they were doing about money. That includes Lincoln, Kennedy, all of them. Just, it's an interesting study. We can't go into it here. So they had some fits and starts. The, the bankers wanted to get control of the system, and they, they had these problems with the First and Second Bank of the United States. didn't work, so they kind of laid low for a while. They laid low until about 1913. Does anybody know what happened in 1913? I think a lot of you do. Our Congress ceded their authority to issue the nation's currency to a private institution called the Federal Reserve, which is no more federal than Federal Express. You've heard it before. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, over the last hundred years, the vestiges of what was supposed to be a sound money system based on gold and silver coin, constitutional specie, coin that had been used for money throughout all of recorded history, was undermined from 1913 to this day. Now, that has taken on, um, 
Well, the, the way that actually came about, I'll go into this a little bit. I was trying to decide whether I had enough time, but I think I do. Over the last hundred years, you know, you've got this thing that's, uh, that's called the Great Depression. It comes along, and you know what? Bernanke, he's a student of that. He really didn't like what happened during the Great Depression because they were limited in the amount of money they could print. And he thought that was just a horrendous thing. No, we would have never had the Great Depression. He even apologized. We're sorry, we caused the Great Depression. We'll never do it again. Why? Because they were limited in the money that they could create. So we had these problems with the Great Depression. We were going into this tremendous deflation. And there are a lot of people that, that subscribe to this, this idea that World War II is what ended the Great Depression. Well, back up a little bit to 1933. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually actually called in the gold. And when he called it in, he paid the people $20 for every ounce that he gave them and then turned right around and revalued it at $35. Boy, that's a neat trick, isn't it? How would you like to be able to do that? I would love to be able to do that, I guess, if I were had the morals and the scruples of some of these guys. But what that did is it served to stop the deflation in his tracks and begin this inflationary trend that we're dealing with to this very day. So we come up on, after World War II, a lot of the gold actually flowed into the United States. A bunch of gold came in because they didn't want Hitler doing it. If Hitler won, guess what? He was going to confiscate their gold. So it flowed into the United States. We ended up winning the war, so we've got victory plus a lot of the gold in our shores. The Brenton Woods systems came out of that. Uh, that lasted for a while until we began to print money here in the United States. Okay? We began to print it to pay for Johnson's Great Society, guns and butter, right? So instead of, you know, the, the, the people overseas are looking at this going on, and they're going, wait a minute, especially over in France. De Gaulle's going, I'm not going to let you debase the money. We're going to call our gold back at $35 an ounce while, while we still can. So all the gold began to fly out of the United States, just literally tons of it. And so Nixon in 1971 said, no more. Close the window on gold convert convertibility uh, nationally, internationally, and that was it. From that time on, we have traded on a purely fiat system where all these paper currencies just trade on each against each other based on this thing called confidence. Confidence in who can manage it and who can print less of it and, and, and institute monetary policies and manage their economies. And, and so this whole idea of getting in and putting their fingers into the economies really began to take hold. So that's the history of money in the United States. It kind of got us up to where we're at today. If you want to read a book on this, there's a, there's a great one by uh, Murray Rothbard. It's called The History of Money and Banking in the United States from Colonial Times to World War II. Very detailed, got a lot of good information on it, and I would highly recommend that you read that. Now, let's talk about why we're here today. Simply this. The 100-year reign of the Federal Reserve must end. And we have to ask the question, why? Why? Is it just because it's unconstitutional? Is it because our founders said no to paper money? Well, yeah, that's a part of it. That's a part of it. But the question remains, why did they feel that way? Why did they feel that way? Well, I tell you, we discussed some of the tangible reasons here that are measurable. Um, and those are interesting. But I submit this to you. Um, we don't understand our history. We don't understand what happens when these monetary systems die. And I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of dealing with historical revisionism. I'm tired of it. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we turn and in everything we see, we went on some tours. I went on some tours with my daughters, and I'm telling you, they had these, these, uh, these tours that you're going around in Washington, D.C., and I could tell you one about Thomas, Thomas Jefferson and make your toes curl. Uh, but one in particular, again, out, at, out at, uh, at Independence Hall here in good old Philadelphia. We took a tour there yesterday. And the tour guide is talking about how when, when the Constitution was written, the, the founders really wanted a powerful central government. Oh, yeah, and I almost did the same thing. Of course, it's real quiet, you know, and everybody's very quiet in there. And, you know, and, and I went, no. 
You know, and a couple of people around me looked at me, and I'm going, mm, sorry. But I, I was going to challenge him there in the question and answer session. Didn't get a chance to, but afterward, I went and asked him. I said, where did you, where did you get your, uh, your information on them wanting a powerful central government? And I had an opportunity to stand there and talk to him. He started flipping his hat a little bit, kind of nervously, like, oh, got one of those guys here. <laughs> said, no, they didn't want a powerful central government. They wanted a limited central government. And the Tenth Amendment said specifically that they were, they were to have their only their enumerated powers and everything else was reserved to the states. And he kind of went, well, yeah, maybe I'll change my language in that. I'm thinking, right, yeah. This is how you deal with those crazies. But this is what we have to do, people. We have to take control of this, and we have to stand against it wherever we, wherever we see it. We've got to stand against these things. Um, Jefferson, quote him, said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Now, that's a mouthful. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, these guys were smart guys. First by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Well, folks, let me tell you what. These guys understood, and the, 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 their views are being written out of history. Okay, through historical revisionism. Where did they get these ideas? Now, one of the issues that, that I'm frankly a little bit tired of in the historical revisionism as well is where did they get these ideas? Okay, they had this thing in their mind called natural law. Okay, natural law. So whether, whether you believe that Jefferson and, and, and Benjamin Franklin and some of the founders were Christians or not, they derived their worldview and their legal system from the Judeo-Christian Bible. That's where they got their moral compass. And you can go and look in Proverbs 20.12, or excuse me, it's 20.10 and Proverbs 11.1 1 and Deuteronomy 25, if you happen to know. They talks about this thing called honest weights and measures. Honest weights and measures. And this is what they wrote into the Constitution. The U.S. Constitution gave Congress an Article 1 Section 8, the power to fix the standard of weights and measures. They knew that this honesty thing was important. Okay? We need honest money. Now, anybody who's heard Ron Paul talk about this, he used to use the term honest money a lot. Sound money's kind of come in and and replaced that as being the main term. There's, There's this issue of saying, listen, folks, when we're dealing with one another, when I'm dealing with you, you expect me to be honest with you, not to cheat you. So why can't the form of money that we have carry that attribute with it? And the founders wrote into the Constitution, yes, that's what. This is what historically honest money has been. It has been gold and silver coin. So let's do that. Jefferson said, if you walk away from that, guess what? You're going to lose your country. What's happening? How? Why is it happening? Inflation. They're, they're printing this stuff up, the Federal Reserve is, and they're handing it over to our treasury and our central government, and they're buying our freedom from us. Forty cents on every dollar that's spent today is borrowed money. It's not just borrowed money, it's printed borrowed money. Is there something dishonest about that? Is there something wrong with that? You know, this whole idea in America now, the things, you know, you can't say it's right or wrong. You're right, you're, you're wrong, your truth, my truth. They're all... No, there is a right and wrong. And this, what is happening now with our monetary system and has been for the last hundred years, is wrong. Sheriff Mack spoke earlier of some of these agencies that we love to hear about, the NSA, the TSA, the EPA, the NEA, FDA. Guess what? Think about 40, 40 cents on every dollar that's funding them. Gone tomorrow because they can't borrow money, because they can't just print it up and hand it over. What does that do for our freedoms and liberties? be an amazing thing, wouldn't it? Because the lifeblood of tyranny is printed debt money. That's what it is today. So we need to chop out and cut off that supply. Well, how do we do that? You know, it's very simple. Again, our founders were pretty smart guys. They give us Article 1, Section 10, which says, no state shall issue anything but gold and silver coin as a tender payment in debts. Well, guess what? There are some states that are standing up and saying, hey, I like that idea. Last year, Utah, 2011, passed the first Sound Money Act in over 80 years in this nation. 
Amen. I'm telling you what, it, it, it caught some attention. It flew under the radar and popped up, and they're going, where did that come from? And they're not liking it very much at all. There are several states right now that are working for sound money throughout the United States here. They're having a difficult time of it this year because guess what? The, uh, the bankers are alerted, and they are not happy. And so we need people in each and every state to go out and actively work this. This issue of sound money is about a whole lot more than just constitutional issues because guess what? Monetary systems, when they die, bring a hardship to the people that we have not experienced and don't really understand here. And we're on the verge of it in this nation. So anybody who thinks for one minute that the 2008 financial crisis that happened is in the rearview mirror and that's it, it's done... They're smoking some of that stuff that's legal in California now. (laughs) Maybe too much of it. We've got a problem here, folks. This, This whole financial crisis has morphed into a sovereign debt crisis. And when the Federal Reserve and Bernanke and all these other pundits stand up and say, you know what, the Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort. That is baloney. It's a lie. Because the sad reality is, the lender of last resort is you and me. Because when they print the money to pay off all of this debt, they inflate the currency away, and your savings and my savings is stolen from us. And so whether we're paying it directly through taxes or whether we pay through it inflation, that is how it is paid back. We're the lender of last resort, and I have to tell you, folks, because of the derivatives that are out there and the backstopping that the Fed has done of the European problems that are going on right now, it amounts to literally trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. It will never be paid back with money with the same purchasing power as what you're carrying in your wallet today, if you have paper. How many of you saw uh, Ron Paul and Ben Bernanke do their last little uh, exchange? Wasn't that nice? Here's what he did. He held up one of these. And you know what? When he held up this silver coin in front of Ben Bernanke, you could just about see the blood drain from his face. (laughs) The force in the monetary, global monetary system universe just had a big disturbance in it. I mean, he's just, he was, you could just see him. I mean, it was a, how dare you put that in front of me? But this is it, folks. These are the, this is the Achilles heel of the banking system right here because it's honest, real money. And if we can have this compete, that's all we're asking for. We want to end the Fed. We want to nullify the Fed. Here's how we do it. You institute sound money at the state level. And you get 10, 15 states doing this, and you're going to have a competing currency with Federal Reserve notes, and the Federal Reserve and its system will die on the vine all by itself. There's a lot of hardship that can be avoided if we're able to do this, and we don't have a lot of time. We do not have a lot of time. The destruction of the family that happens when these monetary systems die is is something that is horrendous. You have divorce, you have suicide, you have families blown apart as they're out trying to just scratch a living. I talked, I talked with a, I was doing a little bit of a protest in front of a place here a week ago. I do that once in a while. And, and I was talking with a lady from Russia. And she was telling me about when they went through their monetary system problems and their economic collapse in the early 90s. She said, you know what? For two years, I was scared to death when it became fall. She said, I would literally tremble because I knew the cold that I was going to have to suffer through for several months. She said, I will never in my life forget that. And if we think for one minute that that can't happen here, we're fooling ourselves. We have got to take this issue seriously, and we've got to take it seriously now. This legislative session is about over, maybe a little bit behind the curve in terms of getting sound money legislation introduced at your state. But I urge you, I plead with you to take this seriously. Get these things ready. Get the legislation ready. Get the bills written very tightly so we understand what we're trying to do and accomplish, that we overcome the major objections of the banking system, and have them ready for next year. At worst case, you'll have them available for special sessions should there be an emergency where you can say, here it is, pass it, let's get it going. 
because we've got to set up and place in put in place protections for you and for me. And legislators, although because it's an election year this year, they're not necessarily taking a lot of strong action. They're listening. They understand. They're paying their bills too. They're seeing gas at four bucks a gallon. They're seeing their grocery bills go up. They know what's going on. They know what's going on. They need urging, urging from you and from me. And it is my heartfelt prayer that each and every one of you here in this room will engage yourself and your friends in this battle. Thank you very much.